Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Hello and welcome to today's Commonwealth Club. I'm Scott Schaefer, senior editor of the Politics and Government Desk at KQED and co-host of our weekly show, Political Breakdown. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest uh, speakers today, Mayors Libby Schaff and Sam Licardo. Libby Schaff uh, is a native, uh, born and raised in Oakland, uh, where she's been mayor since 2015. Mayor Schaff, welcome. Thank you, Scott. Just a few more days, we can say that. <laughs> Sam Licardo is mayor of San Jose, the nation's 10th largest city, uh, a longtime San Joseian. Is that how you say it? More or less. San Jose. Yeah. That'll work. How would you say it? San Jose. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, he took office in 2015 as well. And uh, Mayor Licardo, welcome to you. Great to be with you, Scott. All right. So uh, both mayors, of course, are winding up their final days in office. Um, so let me just begin by asking you simply, um, what, are you, like, what are you proudest of the last eight years? Uh, I think for me, kind of a specific thing and then maybe a general thing, um, specifically what we're leaving for the next generation of children. Uh, we started something called the Oakland Promise. We actually raised privately a $50 million quasi-endowment that for the next generation guarantees that every low-income baby born in Oakland will get a $500 college savings account and every public school graduate will get a $1,000 a year scholarship for either four-year college, two-year college, or a trade certificate program. Hmm. We also um, got Measure AA Pass that will provide ongoing expansion to this college access, um, a cradle to career continuum, as well as for the first time in Oakland, provide universal access to quality preschool for all three and four-year-olds. So I feel like we are really, uh, we leaned in really heavily mm -hmm. for our children and that this will pay off for future generations. And you know, generally, I've, I really tried <laughs> to not just take the easy way out, do the cute you know, press release and press conference, but to really do things for the long-term interests in Oakland. I'm sure Sam will agree that you feel like previous leaders kind of kicked the can down the road and it landed on your head. <laughs> and uh, I tried not- You're gonna say that about us too, Libby. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, I tried not to do that. I tried instead to plant some seeds in the hopes that other, others will enjoy the shade. Yeah. Sam, what about you? Yeah, I guess I'd start with the general. It's interesting how mayors view the world, right? We, we inherit the crisis of the moment. And I feel like you know, my contribution, I think our contribution is working with this wonderful team has really been trying to reorient uh, San Jose from the battles of the past. At the time, it was, when I started, it was pension reform. It was driving 600 cops out of the city and 1,000 city workers that we lost. And we were just licking our wounds from the Great Recession and, and re reorienting uh, the city toward the future. And um, you know, it's not a coincidence that I would think about pro initiatives like, you know, uh, a college promise-like program we call San Jose Aspires that's helping 2,000 first-generation students pave a path to college or preserving thousands of acres in Coyote Valley or bringing BART to San Jose or expanding Google in downtown, all those things that have our residents talking about the future and thinking about how San Jose can become the next great American city rather than battling about all the, the issues of the past. And so I, I feel like we have changed the dialogue and that's critically important in any city. You know, mayors come in, as you did eight years ago, with grand plans and aspirations and campaign promises and all that stuff. And then, you know, reality kind of strikes. Uh, what do you wish you had known uh, when you took the job, when you walked into the mayor's office? Mm -hmm. I wish I had known that homelessness was going to explode the way that it did. Mm -hmm. And that it is no longer all right to say, you know, that is the county's responsibility. Something like homelessness is everyone's responsibility. And frankly, the kind of fragmentation, the layers, the silos of government is really what is um, slowing progress. 
Um, Sam and I worked together, in fact, under your leadership as the chair of the California Big City Mayors. Um, for the first time, we were able to get direct funding to big cities from the state of California so that we didn't have to kind of argue with our county governments uh, around how to um, address the crisis of homelessness. What but that, you, that you, was a surprise. If you had known, like what would you have done? I would have started sooner. I wouldn't have spent one second saying this is the county's responsibility. I would have just gotten right involved. Yeah, what about you? Yeah, you know, not surprisingly, we talk about homelessness, right? It is in every big city in the Western United States, every mayor is going to say this is our biggest problem that we haven't fixed. And I think what I would have liked to have known when I started eight years ago was all the conventional solutions uh, need to be reimagined. Uh, the notion that here in the Bay Area where we're taking five or six years to build a typical apartment building and it costs $800,000 per unit to build, um, the reality is we're not gonna tackle this crisis the same old way. And so I think you know what Libby has done in, in Oakland has been tremendous uh, with a lot of innovative solutions. We stole some of her ideas, other cities have stolen ours. You know, we started converting motels back in 2016. We realized that was something that provided an opportunity for us to do it faster, less expensively. We started building prefabricated quick build housing on near you know, on Caltrans sites near freeways and things like that that could really start to accelerate our ability to provide housing that is dignified, private bedrooms, private bathrooms, you know, safe. Uh, and I wish we were doing that eight years ago because we would be much further ahead mm -hmm. in tackling this crisis. But I think, you know, all the mayors, and particularly in the big cities in California, have had a great network. And Libby is just wrapping up her term and leading uh, the charge with that group. Uh, it is, you know, we, we learn so much from talking to each other. It's remarkable how much we all have in common. Is it really, uh, does it, you know, annoy you that people think mayors, it's up to mayors to solve homelessness. People expect us to ensure that the basketball team wins or that the weather is good. <laughs> like, you know, it just, it just comes with the territory, right? That's so true. People know who their mayor is. Does anybody here know who your county supervisor is? Your state assembly member? You probably know your president, your governor, and your mayor. Yeah. And so that's just what we signed up for. Yeah. And, you know, we try and have a sense of humor, uh, but we also, you know, we live in the world of accountability, right? We live in our communities. We go to the grocery store. Our kids go to school with, you know, our constituents' kids. I can't tell you how many times I've like just wanted to have a peaceful moment on the playground and <laughs> soon. <laughs> Actually, you know, Scott, it's just never going to happen. <laughs> you said people are going to stop calling me mayor in a few days. Like, does anyone not call Willie Brown mayor? Um, I think I think once you've you've had the title, yeah. like people assume you still know how to solve everything yeah. or fix their parking ticket. Which, phone. by the way. We never fix parking tickets, ever. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I, I was talking to uh, Mayor Brown. His office is right next door. Um, and uh, we were chatting uh, about his time as speaker. You know, he was speaker for many years. And then he was mayor for eight years. And I said, Wh which of those offices do you feel like you made a bigger impact in? And without hesitating, he said, mayor. You of know, course. Because, you're, yeah. because you can do things. It is. I mean, it, you know, Libby's right. You, you do get blamed for everything. I mean, I, I routinely get asked questions about how we're going to fix immigration. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I live in a city that's very diverse with many uh, immigrants, many of whom are struggling to deal with documentation and everything else. And so we create an office to provide them information and support. But you know you're just not going to. Um, on the other hand, you have an enormous opportunity. Uh, and what you have is as mayor is an opportunity to create a platform to convene people, to bring people without resources who have lived experience together with people who do have resources uh, who can help and you can solve problems by bringing people together and that is the great thing about being mayor. It's why it's the best job on the planet, uh, being mayor in a big city. On the other hand, it's you know, no recipe for a lot of sleep. Yeah. <laughs> if you could run again, would you have? Oh yeah. Really? It's the best job in the world. Okay. I mean, other than maybe when a pandemic hits, but for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about that because yeah. that was a huge challenge. Uh, and there was no pandemic playbook, you know. And the Bay Area actually was the first, I think, in the country to shut things down. Yeah. Um, talk about what was going on behind the scenes, you know, that led up to that day in March. <laughs> well, we were having a lot of group counseling sessions, all the mayors <laughs> were, by Zoom. And thank goodness, because um, it was a huge support for me to be able to hear 
hey, Libby and Eric and LA and others are, are, hey, we're all grappling with these same challenges. And yes, we're all frustrated that we're not getting enough information. And so there's a great learning opportunity, obviously, through all that. Um, but what's interesting is how many things did start out here in the Bay Area. I mean, you know, we were together launching efforts to, for example, uh, ensure that nobody would get evicted and, and ensure moratoriums were in place so we would not exacerbate the horrible homelessness that we all have in our communities. Uh, and, and, and efforts really to work collaboratively with health authorities. And I think, you know, great leadership all around as I think about Libya and London. And, and, and the good news is I think what we saw is that government could work. Uh, and people could work together. We don't always see that, but I think we saw that during the pandemic. You mentioned London Breed. Um, I remember the day that, uh, the, that the closures were announced and she jumped the gun by about an hour and announced hers first and then the rest of the counties did it. Was that, a, was that I'm assuming that didn't go unnoticed by the rest of you. Well, but let's, one of the frustrations about being the mayors of Oakland and San Jose Not a county. is everyone thinks that we have the same powers exactly. that the mayor of San Francisco yeah, yeah, has. Yeah. And believe you me, we do not. Uh, she <laughs> is one of the strongest strong mayors in the country. Um, you aren't even a strong mayor. Yeah, we have what's a hybrid system, but it's very antiquated. And then Oakland is kind of one of the weaker strong mayor forms of government. Yeah. So it's just you know, I can admit this now, sometimes I would learn about what our county's directives were on the news, just like you. And it, it pretty much pissed me off because the public <laughs> expects you to know everything. Yeah. And then, Scott, you remember I had a very unique entrance into the pandemic. Uh, I'll never forget my phone ringing one day. And I'm like, why is Gavin Newsom calling me? And he's like, ah, Libby. There's this cruise ship. Mm. Oh, yes. I remember that well. The Grand Princess. And I'm like, why can't it go back to San Francisco? <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember that year I'd asked my husband what he wanted for his birthday. And he said, you know, my birthday's on a Saturday this year. All I want is for you to not work mm. for one, one Saturday. And I remember saying, honey, I am so sorry. But <laughs> no. and why was that a city issue as opposed to a county? Because it was the port, right? Well, the Port of Oakland is an independent department of the city of Oakland. OK. But also, the governor knows that if he's going to do something in Oakland, that, that it needs at least my blessing. Yeah. And whether it needs my blessing legally or not, I am, mayors are, mm -hmm the people with the biggest megaphones to say whether or not this was a good thing or a bad thing. And honestly, while there's a whole history of Oakland often bearing the burdens of San Francisco's economy, uh, just like our working port has really had health impacts on the fence line communities for decades and decades, uh, it, it was important to really say this is the right thing to do. Uh, that this is a moment where we all need to step forward and be humanitarians. Um, and I'll tell you just the logistics of getting the crew repatriated yeah. to many different countries. Mm. That was a, an unbelievable uh, logistical process. So that was, that was a unique entry. In fact, I was with all of you up in Sacramento remember, as the ship was well. pulling in. <laughs> um, remember I was in the back row, like texting people <laughs> while we were having Meeting a press conference. Yes. Yeah. That was yeah. before the shutdown, right? Yes, that was right. The canary in the coal mine. But that was a canary in the coal mine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I want to say Sam did something really unique at that moment. Mm. He actually called for the big city mayors to have a conference, we started by phone and then we soon moved to Zoom, which is headquartered in San Jose. <laughs> I still don't know how to work it, but. <laughs> <laughs> For a while, we actually met every single night. I think it was at 10 p.m. Yeah. Yeah, 10 p.m., all the mayor, big city mayors of California. Hmm. And I want you all to know, Eric Garcetti is a nerd. <laughs> that guy like knew every like scientific study. Um, it was on honestly, it was great to have him on yeah. our calls because yeah, we all learned so much. Yeah. No, he's a, yeah, it's an impressive guy, and he plays the piano. Um, <laughs> what were the toughest decisions you had to make? Other, I mean, obviously, shutting down businesses, I'm sure, was right up there. But like, what were the moments? Because of course, we didn't know where it was going. There was no vaccine. We had a president who was, you know, 
leave it at that. Uh, not helpful. He was right. not helpful. Right. So, yeah. Well, you know, as Libby noted, a lot of the tough decisions we didn't make, and so part of the challenge was just figuring out, okay, we're going to support this or not. <laughs> and frankly, when you're in a pandemic or in a crisis of any kind, the last thing anyone needs is to have governments fighting one another. So often it was, okay, are we going to just support and obviously ask hard questions uh, in the meantime, or or do we have a different position here? And so those were some tough ones. I mean, we didn't shut down any businesses in the city because again, this decision made by the county, but we had to shut down, for example, an arena and a lot of city facilities. And obviously that's lost, a lot of jobs lost and, and, and a lot of pain in different ways. I, you know, I think that the crisis we were dealing around what we were going to do with tenants uh, who are facing just monumental challenges, figuring out how to pay rent as if it's not already hard enough. I think those are some of the toughest decisions we had to face. What do you think? I, I feel like it's, we're going to be studying this pandemic for years in terms of the impact yeah. that it's had on people, especially children, probably. Um, what do you feel is like coming down the road, you know, assuming mm -hmm. it doesn't completely change course and there's another pandemic? I mean, like, what are the things that you worry about? Of course, you the next mayor is going to really have to worry about it. But like, what do you what do you think is coming that they need to be prepared for? Um, in addition to the toll on mental health for our young people, especially our adolescents, I think there is just a general malaise and anger and disappointment in government. Mm -hmm. And it makes me really sad. I mean, when you look at like, you know, Pew's timeline of people's faith in government, there's this moment where whether you were a Democrat or Republican, after 9-11, this entire country came together and had tremendous faith in government. And this global pandemic should have been that same moment. I mean, when I walked onto the mass vaccination site at the Oakland Coliseum, that the federal government stood up and there were reservists, National Guards from all over the country in Oakland helping people get that vaccination. I, I had tears streaming down my face. Mm. I'm like, this is mm. what government does. It's mm. literally saving lives. It's bringing peace and, and a sense of security um, to everybody. Yeah. And yet that is not how people came out of this. It is not what people feel right now. People are unbelievably grumpy yeah. right now yeah. about every aspect of government. Yeah. And I wish that weren't the case. Yeah. yeah. What about you? What do you see? You know, as I think about what's not in the headlines right now that someone should be thinking about over the next five years, it's, it's not terribly sexy, but it's our really basic infrastructure needs around, for example, the grid, uh, which is failing us. And it's not just us. I mean, it's failing Texas and a lot of other folks, too. And the massive investments that are required simply to maintain. Will the infrastructure bill help with that? Yes, but it's going to be a drop in the bucket. I mean, no, I'm not in any way criticizing the Biden administration. They did exactly uh, what they needed to do, uh, what they could do, uh, given the constraints they had. And I think, I think it's a great bill, as well as Inflation Reduction Act, which is also going to help quite a bit as well. But I think we need a dramatic rethinking about how we deliver electricity um, in this country. I think we need to figure out how we can actually move to distributed uh, generation and storage uh, in a way because the, the tens of billions of dollars that are required just in Northern California alone are, are going to bankrupt every ratepayer. Similarly, I think the same way about water. I mean, those basic infrastructure issues are going to kill us uh, if we're not thinking much more innovatively and really trying to be more pragmatic rather than allowing the same political interest to drive the same results, which have gotten us into the situation. Yeah. Uh, the infrastructure bill, of course, has money for transportation. And if you look at lingering impacts of the pandemic, transportation, BART, Muni, I'm sure, you know, AC Transit, all of them yeah. have seen ridership go down and not return. Um, a lot of federal money has propped them up. Uh, how concerned are you that, you know, when that money dries up, which is going to happen fairly soon, I imagine, like uh, what's going to happen? Yeah, they're facing a fiscal cliff. There's no question. Many of the agencies are. And, you know, as mayors, we tend to focus on building. Like we all want to get BART extension complete all the way through Santa Clara, example, for example. But uh, operating these systems, th that's really going to be the major challenge over the next half decade uh, that everyone's trying to wrestle with. And there haven't been any solutions yet. I think you're hearing probably some murmuring about a focus on using cap and trade money here in California to help support operations. 
that's the most logical path. Yeah. I also think we need to wait and see what happens with live, work, commute patterns. I don't think we're ever going to go back to the way things were, especially in the Bay Area. It's mm -hmm. funny, other parts of the country have, but we, for some reason, have not, and I don't think we ever will. Oh. And so we can't use an old system that was built on a different reality. And, um, you know, I took BART here just, just now, mm -hmm. and it was really weird to be able to sit down in a seat. <laughs> you know, that used to yeah. not be the case. Yeah. I took Bart here as well from the mission, and I was going down the escalator, and there was some guy walking on the railing up the escalator. Oh, gosh. And then I got to the bottom, and there were two people hopping over, so they weren't paying. And I just, I just thought, wow, it's like, this is one reason people just feel like things are out of control, yeah. you yeah. know? And it, whether it's encampments everywhere, and I mean, are, are they wrong? I mean, do governments have their arms around these things? I think the issue around mental health is one that we are all seeing. And I, the mayors, I think, got together this year and really backed up Governor Newsom in his care courts proposal, which, you know, was opposed by a lot of civil, civil liberties groups, which normally we would be pretty aligned with. Mm -hmm. But I don't think anyone thinks it's progressive to allow people who are clearly mentally um, ill to, that, that cannot make good decisions for themselves to be out on our streets without a roof over their heads. Yeah, and you know, for those who may not know, care courts is that was a legislation that passed and will uh, allow counties with guardrails to compel people into mental health treatment, and they'll have a public defender representing them. So it's not like they're going to get put into, you know, into some facility without anybody knowing about it. But but it will also compel the counties to provide the care and to provide housing. Yeah. yeah. You think the money's there for that? Well, that's what the argument is about right now, yeah. so we shall see. Money's not there yet, uh, but fundamentally, we don't have a choice. It needs to be there. And you know, the great opportunity, certainly, of the past two years surpluses are past, but I think we need to refocus here. At, that, you know, what's remarkable about this collection of mayors that we routinely meet with and, and, and work with, and Libby did a great job leading them this year, is we've got Republicans, we've got progressive Democrats, we've got moderate Democrats, and everybody's aligned on these issues around homelessness and mental health. It's, you know, because mayors have to be pragmatic. We hope everyone else will be similarly. And pragmatic. Congress should hire us as consultants. <laughs> <laughs> really good at <laughs> Careful what you ask for. <laughs> um, you mentioned, we've talked, you mentioned Gavin Newsom, we've mentioned Joe Biden. Um, uh, Willie Brown got mentioned. I, you've, uh, your terms have, uh, you started in 2014? 15. All of us started. 15. We got okay, elected so, in 14, okay. started in 15. So three presidents, two governors, <laughs> um, particularly the governor. I mean, what have you noticed? I mean, Jerry Brown, who you know, he endorsed you, uh, and you worked for him, I think. I did. Yeah. Uh, what, um, what do you make of the difference? Between, I mean, as human beings, they're extraordinarily different. Uh, but in terms of, you know, working with them and priorities, and I mean, obviously, Gavin Newsom has been willing to invest in homelessness and housing, but like, what, what's your experience been? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think um, we've had more experience probably with Gavin. Uh, somebody who's, who's been in there longer and has had more direct engagement, I think, with mayors. Uh, and that has been helpful, particularly around homelessness. Uh, Although they were both mayors. That's true. Yeah, good point. Uh, clearly, you know, Governor Newsom was more willing to make those investments around homelessness and affordable housing. Uh, and I guess it, it's really a, a case of Governor being a product of their times. Uh, governor Brown got us through the Great Recession when everyone understood the importance of tightening the belt. Um, clearly, Governor Newsom had new opportunities. That's not to say we haven't had plenty of challenges, too. Um, he he would, recently blocked the funding for the homeless stuff, the homeless program. Like, yeah. there was a billion dollars. He yeah. didn't like, oh, yes, he didn't like their plans. We yeah. recall. And you yeah. recall, yeah. yeah there was some what was that phone call like? Interesting discussion around that. It was actually, you know, I became aware when we were talking to his team, I think the day before the announcement, and several mayors were on the line together. Um, Look, okay, you know, we have differences. There's no question about that. Um, on the other hand, it's helpful to have a governor who's elevating this issue, and he certainly has. Uh, we hope that there will also be eventually a commitment uh, to ongoing funding, because that's something the state simply does not provide, is ongoing funding to provide housing, uh, particularly emergency housing, uh, for the unhoused. Uh, we're all passing measures in our own city, uh, tax measures to be able to invest. We had $110 million last year for Measure U. We just passed 
all go in for homelessness overwhelmingly, some for other affordable housing. Um, but ultimately, this problem is too big for any city. We need the state. And I will say this for Governor Newsom. I don't think Governor Brown would have actually asked for that conference call with us. That's right. Like we would have just read it in the paper. So I, I, I will say that Governor Newsom has really uh, respected the big city mayors. Um, even if we don't like what he's going to tell us, he at least warns us before it's in the, the press. Yeah. And we, we have been, um, you know, I feel like we've had an open door as far as trying to influence policy. We don't always win, but at least we're listened to. I think with Jerry Brown, he, being mayor really was sort of an eye opener for him in some ways. You oh, know. Everyone, like, you know, Congress member Dellums, it was a pretty big eye opener. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, uh, but, you know, one of the things Jerry Brown did, well, well, two things. One, he really used the redevelopment agency to build more housing. Yep. And then he, and then he they, eliminated it <laughs> when he became governor. Yeah, what, was, what, what difference has that made? Now, Scott, I want you to know, Jerry Brown, his big goal was to build, you know, 10,000 or bring 10,000 people to Oakland. Um, while I have been mayor, we have added almost 20,000 new homes to Oakland. So it's right. actually the biggest building boom right. Oakland has had since the 1906 earthquake. Yeah, how many of those were in the pipeline? Um, not a lot. I mean, oh, the market when you rate, got there. market rate, many, many, but almost zero in the affordable housing pipeline. So we've worked really hard. We were able to double affordable housing production uh, compared to the previous eight years. And we're leaving the next administration 2,200 units affordable, deeply affordable, that are in the pipeline ready to go. Yeah. What are you, San Jose, are redevelopment agencies the city or county? Uh, so the city, we yeah. actually had the second largest redevelopment agency in the state, and we were producing an enormous amount of affordable housing with it. Obviously, when it goes away, uh, that's a big loss. And so we passed, at the time, the largest uh, housing bond um, in the state and in our county. And then I went to the voters in our own city to have uh, fle more flexible dollars that we could use to provide both services and housing. It's really focused on the unhoused. Um, so, you know, there's simply not enough dollars in the world to solve this problem. We need to solve it through more innovative approaches, and that means how do we find more nimble ways to build housing? How do we get out of the way, eliminate the red tape? Uh, and enable housing to get built faster. I think there is, isn't there some talk about recreating a different version of that? I, know, I think I talked to Sheng Tao, who's the incoming mayor in Oakland, and there was some, I, th I thought she said there was a ballot measure maybe or something that would, am I misremembering that? She might be talking about, I mean, I'm very involved with a uh, potential statewide ballot measure to make it easier for local governments to pass housing bonds. Right now, you have to get a two thirds vote. Um, and we're trying to make that just a regular majority, as well as expand some of the allowable uses for, for bonds. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really unfortunate that cities have had to go to our voters. Um, in 2016, we got past Measure KK, which was Oakland's first local infrastructure bond, but included $100 million for affordable housing. And then we just got passed in this last election, Measure U, which has $350 million for affordable housing, plus the money to keep our road repair program going. What's the source of that money? It's um, an ad valorem tax. So it's on, it's based on your property value and it goes on to your property taxes. Yeah. Um, you uh, are in San Jose, of course, which is in the sort of the middle of Silicon Valley, I guess, you know, uh, what do you think, how do you think tech has done in terms of being a good citizen? Like what's been, mm. the, what has been the ups and downs of having tech? I mean, it's in Oakland and San Francisco, yeah. especially here as well, but like good partners, bad partners, mixed? Yeah, yeah it depends, right? Um, <clears throat> we, we've all seen the impacts of tech growth and we know what's doing to housing costs and, and certainly the challenges. On the other hand, I'm sure none of us would like to give up all those great jobs in our community. Um, and. Really, it depends an awful lot on the leadership. I and mean, you take somebody like Chuck Robbins at Cisco, uh, who did, you know, was the first to step forward and say, we're going to make major commitments to addressing the unhoused crisis in our community. Uh, and months later, we saw many other companies step up, although admittedly, maybe with larger commitments, because Apple and Google and it, uh, Facebook and others were able to make those commitments. Uh, but, you know, it was refreshing to see Google say, we're going to build a six million square foot campus in your city. And by the way, we're also going to ensure that 4,000 housing units get built and a quarter of those are going to be rent restricted and affordable. You know, not every company is willing to do that, as you can imagine. Um, 
So it's been mixed. There are other companies, that, frankly, it's hard to ever get the CEO on the phone. And is that just because they, don't, they know you want to ask for something? Yeah, they know. <laughs> and of course, I'm going to ask them for something. I got a community I'm representing. And they just, what is it? They just don't feel like that's their job to. Well, I mean, part of it is, to, to be honest, look, two thirds of their employees are located in other countries in the world. Their customers are 95% of them might be in other countries. These are global corporations. And we know that they're, they might be headquartered here in the Valley, but in fact, they're growing elsewhere because it's far too expensive for them to hire here. And so, you know, it's hard for them to justify in their minds to shareholders, why are we doing all this for San Jose and we're not doing it in Shanghai? Mm. What about you? With well, you know, it was interesting when I became the, the mayor, it just, Oakland didn't feel like it was part of Silicon Valley, but it quickly was starting to feel that way. I don't know if you remember when Uber mm. bought this major building in our downtown. And you should know, they asked me for a tax break. And I said, no, mm -hmm. um, I did not want to. Right decision. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like once you open the door. Uh, so I never gave anyone a tax break. Yeah. Um, and they, they did end up buying the building. Then they ended up yeah. selling it uh, immediately thereafter. Uh, and I wrote them a letter about how to be a good corporate citizen. But I, I do want to lift up um, a number of the founders, I think, really do care about being good citizens yeah. and are trying to push this different vision of capitalism to be more about stakeholders than shareholders. Mm. And just, you know, number one on that list is Mark Benioff. Yeah, he's um, amazing. Mark. He has been just fantastic uh, for me, for Oakland. Um, you know, Michael Moritz is someone else who made a big investment in the Oakland Promise early on. Um, Jack Dorsey, uh, when the pandemic happened, um, someone said to me, oh, these tech people don't care that much about the digital divide. I sent him an email, and by the next morning, we had $10 million. Wow. To from, get. from Twitter? Not from Twitter, from Jack Dorsey personally. Yeah. Uh, and that allowed us, during that pandemic year, we started the pandemic with only 12% of our low-income students being connected. Mm -hmm. By the end of that year, we got that to 98%. That means they owned their own laptop mm -hmm. at home that their whole family could use. They had a hotspot or a high-speed internet connection, and they had access to tech support in their family's language. Mm -hmm all that by the end of the year. And that's something, Scott, we are never gonna let go of that. We are working to make sure that we keep the digital divide closed for good now, not just only for our students, but for all low-income Oaklanders. Elon Musk returning your emails. Well. Oh, I didn't even bother. <laughs> <laughs> he was, did you see him at the beginning of the pandemic? He tried to keep the Tesla factory open oh, yeah. with no yeah. pandemic restrictions. He was yeah. not. That, yeah, Mark Ben. Not a model. He's had a tough run on Chappelle. Those are on the two different <laughs> yeah. sides of the uh, uh, scale yeah. for me. You said good decision, Sam, about uh, no tax break. Why? <laughs> yeah, I, I've never. Uh, in fact, I remember when Amazon was holding their beauty contest for their second headquarters, and I wrote an op ed in the Wall Street Journal and said, don't do it and try to urge other mayors not to offer any tax incentives because, look, it's a rounding error to these large companies. It's a race to the bottom. It, it, it doesn't really affect their decision. They're going to move where the talent is, mm. maybe where some of the infrastructure is, but they're really focused on talent. And all these giveaways are really the companies that would be there anyway mm. if they're going to take the bait. So my, my sense is, is it's never a good deal for taxpayers. And the best thing you can do with taxpayer money is invest in the people who live in that community and ensure that you're growing talent. Yeah. What, what did you make of, you know, they, uh, Amazon chose New York as one of their cities and then they got so much pressure and blowback from the unions yeah. and the income inequality folks. I guess there was, maybe was it the, um, what was that movement called? I'm forgetting something Wall Street. Uh, Occupy? Occupy, Occupy Wall Street. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, what did you what did you make of that? You know, when they they, they decided, and then they were like, was that a mistake? It seemed, yeah, it seemed a little a lot bit of jobs. Yeah, it seemed a little bit predictable. I mean, there were there was a day a decade or two ago when that just happened, and I think increasingly people are paying closer attention, mm -hmm. and they should. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing I wish tech had gotten a little bit more involved in because when you have so much, I mean, it's great that tech pays such high salaries. But when you have so much income inequality, and in a place like the Bay Area where we have such a shortage of housing, yeah. that income inequality combined with the low supply has caused heartbreaking displacement. 
And difficulty finding people to work. I mean, who wants to commute 90 minutes, right, to mm -hmm. work at Whole Foods or, you know. And it's outrageous. Yeah. yeah. So that's, I wish tech had done more of a fight for a higher minimum wage, a living wage, yeah. those kinds of things. I, I remember uh, before you took office, we were talking about what your priorities were, and you said, I'm going to keep the A's. <laughs> uh, I think at that point, they're still there. The, the Raiders were, you know, you know, whatever they were doing. Well, they, let me just they, remind everyone: when I became the mayor, all three of the sports teams had already decided to leave Oakland. Yeah, well, they became. haven't really decided to leave. Oh, at that time, they had purchased property oh, in Fremont. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, and then they announced they're moving to San Jose, and the Major League bought Baseball blocked that. So, yeah, they were they were on their way out. They were they bad doing corporate citizens. Everything that they. But now they're much better. <laughs> Why? What, what's changed? And do you think they're going to say? I do. I do. And I am so excited about this project because, Scott, um, it's much bigger than baseball. Hmm. You, you look at San Francisco and the waterfront, and for those of us who are old enough to remember what it was like when the Embarcadero Freeway was here. Right here. Mm. Yes. Yep. Oh. I mean, everyone deserves the waterfront. Mm. It's beauty. Uh, public access to waterfront is important. And again, Oakland has paid the price for this whole region. I mean, we are the largest port in Northern California. We, we bear that burden and we will continue to bear it. It's important for our economy and the economy of the entire country. But we have this kind of defunct terminal that is no longer uh, usable for modern container shipping operations. And so I really want to see that be a return to public access, to be a new neighborhood that is going to support tens of thousands of good union jobs, more than 18 acres of public parks, um, 3,000 units of housing, including affordable housing, and yes, an iconic, I don't know if you've seen the designs, this ballpark, I mean, people will travel just to see the architecture, mm. and that is what Oakland deserves world-class beauty that is available to everybody. And what's standing between, you know, the plan and the reality? Um, honestly, there are two things that kept us from getting it done this year that I believe will be addressed next year, or at least I hope so. Yeah. One is, uh, you know, John Fisher wants to see the city uh, win more of the grants that we've applied for to really demonstrate that we can pay for all of the off-site infrastructure improvements to ensure that this new neighborhood is going to be successful, safe, accessible, um, that it, it will re actually reduce pollution um, by improving you know, transit access and walk walkability, bikeability. So we've been doing very well, um, but we haven't quite you know, reached the, the total dollars yet for yeah. all of the improvements. Yeah. The second piece is we are honestly, between you and me and everybody else, um, we are still arguing a bit about the amount of public subsidy. Um, just ask the Oakland Raiders. I just do not think we need to give away too much money to these billionaire sports owners. Um, I do think it's appropriate to invest in public infrastructure, things like those parks and the affordable housing, um, but, but we need to limit uh, how much public money is Is that a deal breaker, these. potentially? It could be. We'll see how the next mayor and the next city council goes. Maybe she'll be easier on them than I've been. Mm. What, what difference have the Sharks made to San Jose? Oh, it's been great in revitalizing the downtown, uh, certainly. And, uh, we're seeing also benefit now with the earthquakes and the new stadium they have. There's, there's a great benefit. And the world is it, is it the World Cup? There's some big soccer. Oh, that's Levi. That's yeah, yeah, that's Levi. Levi next door to us. But we're happy to have all the yeah. hotel rooms full in yeah. downtown San Jose. We've actually benefited enormously from the stadium that's just on the other side of our city limits because every time we have a national championship game or Super Bowl, whatever it was. Folks are downtown. That's great. Yeah. Well, the Niners are at war with Santa Clara, as you know. They've yeah. That's what I read. Pumped a lot of money into <laughs> campaigns. And we, we tried to figure out if we could put the stadium on wheels and maybe just cart it <laughs> a little bit further east. Yeah. We'd have it have them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you, when you look at each other's cities, uh, are there things you wish you had that Oakland has, or are you glad you don't have things Oakland has, <laughs> vice versa? Well, I will start because, Sam, I have always admired. San Jose has long been one of the safest big cities in America. Yeah. And um, 
you know, even with relatively low police staffing, you have managed to keep crime and violent crime um, really managed. And I will just tell you as mayor, there is nothing harder than being responsible for every violent death in your city. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have to hold a mother mm -hmm. who's lost their child to gun violence, there is no depth of grief that is deeper than that. And, and San Jose has always had a very good record in that regard. Why is that, do you think? You know, I, I wish I, I could say we can diagnose all of it. I mean, we have a wonderful police department. It's very hardworking, but very understaffed. We've always been very, very thin, as, as, as Libby noted. I, I think we've had the benefit, frankly, of, of a Silicon Valley that, while very diverse, has also oper offered a lot of economic opportunity to folks to provide a lot of upward mobility. Um, and I think that means, frankly, when people are doing better, they get along better. What about you in terms of Oakland? Oh, I think Libby hit it on you want the aid. nail on the head. No, she, she has a great waterfront opportunity. And in every city with a waterfront opportunity, I mean, we, we do have Alviso, but uh, there are significant constraints on development there. Uh, being able to bring people to the water, I mean, Libby's absolutely right to focus on that because it's a great asset. And I think also Oakland has an incredible uh, arts culture. Uh, and. You know, we've been building a nascent culture around that, but I think being able to say you have a place for artists is so critically important for a city. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, San Francisco, of course, now we have Chase Center. Uh, you know, a lot of concerts used to go down to the S&P Arena. Is that what it's called now? It's, uh, yeah, uh, well, yes, S&P, yes. Yeah. Um, we'll call it the Shark Tank. Shark Tank, okay. <laughs> uh, what difference has that made uh, to Oakland as well? I mean, a lot of events used to go to Oracle. and you know, We're still full all the time. Are we you? just had Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock there, I don't know, night before last. It's fine. Honestly, Oracle is more full. It's actually doing more concerts because the Warriors aren't playing, so they have more nights to offer. Yeah. But it's, it's because it's not a brand new venue, it's more affordable. And if you're going to sell out, rather, whether you're in the expensive venue or the cheap venue. Yeah. Coming back to public safety, uh, I mean, both of you, of course, were mayor when George Floyd was killed. I mean, there were other police shootings, deaths, you know, leading up to that and since. Uh, how, did, how did that incident affect your city, do you think, and the way you think about policing? <laughs> I've had a long journey with this one. Um, I think people forget when I became the mayor in 2015, Oakland had the police marches every Friday night, hmm. often with hmm. fires in the streets, broken windows, every week, mm. every week. So there was already a lot of um, kind of anti-police sentiment and a lot of demand for accountability on police abuse. Um, you know, we, we were able to, to kind of calm that a little bit and not without quite a bit of angst. Uh, and, and it felt like things were going in a much better uh, direction. You know, one hard decision I made was to fire um, Police Chief Ann Kirkpatrick uh, and hire um, someone who really has helped rebuild trust with our community, and that's Chief Armstrong. So that was feeling like it was going in the right direction until George Floyd. And it just, you know, again, tore the scab off a deep wound that, that American cities have. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it was hard because the pandemic was just such a trying time mm -hmm. uh, in general. And to see that that explosion onto the streets and to worry that, you know, people were coming physically back together again, whether it was going to cause a huge surge in disease. Um, it, it was it was. And, and I guess the other thing I'll just say personally, the police represent government. And when government abuses it, it's power. It hurts all of us. It's heartbreaking for all of us who have dedicated our lives to trying to prove to people the, the value, the beauty, the fact that government is our collective best selves. Mm. And so that just felt like it just ripped that to shreds. Yeah. What about San Jose? Well, you know, uh, like every big city, we grappled with the civil unrest and the challenges. The voices needed to be heard. Uh, there's no question. And I think as a result, I and other leaders are hearing with different ears and, and, and seeing with different eyes, and that's important. Uh, but that being said, I, I think there are, you know, there's a difference between a response and a reaction. Uh, and you know, 
the good that I see in the response, for example, now is we're debating how we're going to move investigations of police misconduct out of the police department, out of the internal affairs, into an independent police auditor's office. That's exactly you know, what I've been pushing for and what needs to happen. Um, those are the kinds of responses that don't get headlines. They don't necessarily get hundreds of people cheering for you at City Hall, but that is, I believe, ultimately the kind of path we need to take to improve accountability and build trust often may have nothing to do with what an officer did or didn't do or a department did or didn't do, but you've got to be able to create greater transparency. On the other hand, there were reactions. And, you know, there's a lot of different views about what the proper response was. But, you know, I came out and said, I'm not going to defund. As I recall, uh, Libby also faced a similar challenge. And immediately I had protesters painting expletives on my front uh, yard in, in my house. That was fun. Uh, so, <laughs> so, you know, there's no question that there's a lot of work that needs to be done around issues of race and policing and uses of force and all of that, but it's hard work and it, it doesn't happen overnight. And it's really important for us to respond rather than reacting. Yeah. You know, Mayor Breed has talked before about uh, protests in front of her house yeah. um, and be all Black Lives Matter protesters. And of course, she's black and grew up in uh, you know public housing in San Francisco. and. It made her really angry. It makes her angry still because you know, most of these protesters were white liberals. You know, probably maybe they live in San Francisco, maybe they didn't. Um, but you know, in terms of like the f the police thing, I mean, and the and there was a lot of unrest in Oakland over the year, a lot of broken windows and fires and disruption. I mean, how much of that do you think has come from outside of Oakland? Um, I think it's a mix. I don't want to pretend that it's all from outside Oakland because I think that is not true. Mm. Um, and, and also, I think it is important to um, honor what is absolute pain and the fact that historically government has abused its power. Absolutely. And we have to own that. Um, even though, you know, you individually did not come to government to, to do that, um, you have to respect that others who have held your position or title have. Mm. Um, now, I, I too really am worried about this new practice of protesting at people's homes. Uh, as a woman, as mm -hmm. the mother of young children, um, I feel like it is too much. And, you know, this year, I remember trying to encourage some people to run. We had two open city council seats, including the one for my district. And I was trying to encourage people to run for office, and I could not get anybody. Mm -hmm. They're like, why would I put up with that? And it, it, it's a little too much to ask. And I, I think nationally we're seeing a trend that people, I know you, you got it too, but that the, people are seeing that um, protests are often done at women's homes. And mm. it really does feel mm. very violent and mm. intimidating. Yeah. And yeah, it's I'll, remarkable. You look at the, the large city mayors across the country. And we're, we're on tech strings with all these folks. We're all having exactly the same experience obviously much worse for those who have children uh, women etc i mean you can imagine the dynamics and they can be radically different but the the point is is this reality is in every big city hmm. why do you think that is like what is it partly due to the pandemic you know and well i had protests at my house before the pandemic yeah me too but um, <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah i think i was my 15th day as mayor i got woken up at five in the morning it was quite dramatic mm. um and you know the person who organized most of the protests during my first four years as mayor then ran against me you know built her name recognition mm. through your people the media <laughs> covering <laughs> the, her misdeeds so you know you you guys should think about you know who you yeah. Who well, and what you... I'm sure it wasn't Scott's. Well, I want to ask you, I, I do want to ask you about the media because uh, the media, I mean, we were talking earlier. Uh, yeah, I don't know why, but I record the 10 o'clock news and we watch it and we fast forward through all the garbage and all the crime news and, you know, get basically just watch the sports and the weather. Uh, but, um, you know, what do you make of it? What role has, does the media have in all of this uh, and, and just perpetuating stereotypes? I mean, the, the, the $10 million from... Jack Dorsey. I mean, I don't know if he or you wanted publicity for that, um, but uh, there must be things, good things happening all the time that just, you know, nobody cares. Or the media doesn't care, I should say. Oh, it feels yeah. that way. I mean, I, I remember um, we had 
uh, the Obama Foundation's first like giant job fair. We had two cabinet secretaries at, in Oakland at our convention center. We had, I think, 600 young men of color got a job at this job fair, like on the spot, and then some got them afterwards. And we got no media coverage at all. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there is a protest with like 12 people mm -hmm. down the street at City Hall, and every news station covered that. Mm -hmm. That really pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is a reality there. It's, um, you know, if, if it bleeds, it leads. But the, it, it makes you appreciate and respect um, those, and if I can pander for just a moment, uh, those organizations like KQED that are really focused on getting hard news, news about policy, about decisions that have impact in people's lives. We have all seen a significant decline in local media mm -hmm. uh, resources, certainly throughout the country. We're seeing what it's doing to our newspapers. That is a crying shame. We clearly need a new model uh, because we need to have local reporting. We need to have transparency in government. Uh, and right now, uh, the model's not working. So I hope that whether it's a KQED type model or something else, we can land on something that enables local reporting to actually focus on those big decisions that are happening. That may not be the protest, it may not be the crime scene, but it's those decisions that have the really deep impacts on us over the long run. Yeah. Long I mean, some mayors, uh, I think, have taken just not to talking to reporters or some reporter. I mean, I think it's, it's harder when you're mayor because yeah. like people know, oh, I'm, they're going to be at this ribbon cutting or whatever. And they just, you know, <laughs> but if you're governor, yeah, not I mean, hide from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little easier if you're governor, I think, you know, to, you know, avoid those things. But uh, I mean, do you feel that there are things that you like the media aside from the good, the feel good stuff? Mm -hmm. Are there things of any nature that you would like KQED to cover or anyone else to cover that they're not covering? I, I just. I think you should all, and, and first of all, it's our jobs. It's our jobs to be available to the public. Most people get their news through the media. Um, it, so, you know, we signed up for this to answer the hard questions, to opine on the tragedies and the failures. But I, I wish the news would look at like the ratio of good news versus bad news that you're covering because there is good news happening. Uh, you know, we, we got the vice president of the United States of America, Kamala Harris, to come back to the city where she was born to announce that $50 million quasi endowment for the next generation of Oakland's children. It didn't even make the front page of the newspaper. Hmm. Instead, they ran a picture of the moon. <laughs> It was a pretty moon that night. <laughs> like, had any of you even heard of this? It's a 15, like every child for the next generation. Did any of you know about this? Yeah. It's a big deal. And it got, it got some coverage. Yeah, I think Actually, it, the LA Times probably did the best article on it of yeah, all. I've had those experiences. But like, think of the ratio of good news versus bad. People are depressed. People are angry. They're losing hope. Mm. And there is nothing worse for our democracy mm. Nothing worse for our democracy than when the people have lost hope. Yeah. I think there's a lot of truth in what Libby just said. Now, just take the opposite side. I think the, the media can be tougher on politicians. Um, I, and in part of the challenge is, again, the decline of the newspaper. Of, you know, you tend to have a lot of very young reporters who are kind of new, and you don't have the folks, the veterans, who really understand the dynamics, uh, who's pulling the triggers, and, and what the history of a lot of these decisions really is. Uh, and so too often you see kind of the story that is the product of one machine or another uh, generating uh, a particular story. Um, I long for those days when you had more reporters mm. asking really tough questions mm. uh, and asking follow-up and then challenging you mm. if they disagreed rather than simply printing the other side. I'd much rather have a reporter come back and say, hey, this guy says what you said isn't right, to give me the opportunity of explaining, well, actually, here's what I believe the truth is and here's an objective third-party source. And this is not being more negative, it's being less lazy. Yeah. So I feel like journalists yeah. will just print, this person said this, Yep. This person said that Everybody and not everywhere. actually research yeah. whether or not yeah. we, you know, not what, what the actual truth is. Yeah, well, they're in a rush and they don't have enough time. Yeah, deadlines. well, and there's a, a, a phrase that has become, I think, more common in newsrooms, which is both sidesism. Yeah. Um, where, you know, the two sides of an I issue. I think Donald are, Trump once said that about something. That was kind of disturbing, wasn't it? 
<laughs> well, but the point is that some like climate change, it, there really aren't two sides. Right. There, there's the fringe, right. you know, but you, to give them equal weight yep. is, is not right. You know, and it, I think, you know, the media have, you know, a lot of us have been trained to be balanced. But sometimes balance isn't really the right yeah, so thing. Yeah, do you give equal, forth, yeah. equal weight to um, different the opinions? Plan. Or do you give um, some credence to the truth? Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Questions from the audience. Uh, what are your thoughts on Eric Adams' approach to the unhoused people in New York City? Honestly, I'm not sure what his it, approach is. It makes me a little nervous. He's trying to compel. Oh, is this the mental health? Yeah, it's hard to know exactly because you see the headline, but yeah. you know, I don't know exactly what's. So I, I'll refrain from criticizing, but clearly, like every mayor, he's frustrated with a mental health crisis on the streets. He may be leaning in further than the law will allow. As the Lord knows, we've all been really constrained. Although he's not under Martin v. Boise because it's a Ninth Circuit decision. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, what but is he's. That? It, it, it um, prohibits criminalization of homelessness, oh. um, which, you know, honestly, I support. Uh, we, we did also have a debate about whether California should adopt what New York does, which is a right to shelter. Yeah. And um, personally, I have been very much against that because I think it distracts us from actually working towards a right to housing which is much different than a right to shelter. Yeah. He's a, a former Republican, a former cop, uh, black man, uh, who has been much more pro-police, I think, in a lot, in, in a lot of ways. And, and uh, in a way that London Breed has been, in the sense that she you know, has some street cred, I think, on these things, and was very much in favor of the recall of the DA, who she thought was too uh, easy on crime. Um, being white, uh, when so many of these issues involve race and diversity and inequities, I mean, how do you navigate that? Wow, in, that's, in 30 that's, seconds. that's a simple question. <laughs> um, you know, I think we have to, one, be on a constant journey of educating ourselves around equity issues. Um, I am so grateful to our director of race and equity with the city of Oakland. Darlene Flynn has just been a tremendous resource to me. Uh, I think we have to have tremendous humility as white leaders um, and recognize our privilege. Um, you know, I think for me, it helped that I'm born and raised in Oakland. I graduated from Skyline High School. So I have, I have come up in a city um, which is one of the things I love about Oakland that values diversity and inclusion. Yeah, yeah I think that's all true. I, I would add, I think, uh, as I think about the times, for example, I've challenged our, our county on uh, jail release policies. Um, as I engage in routine conversations with um, our very diverse community, about 40% of our adults were born in a foreign country in San Jose, um, you know, I hear a lot of Spanish-speaking moms telling me about their fears of crime. Um, and, it, you know, it is very apparent to me uh, that the communities that are most hard hit by crime are those communities uh, of color uh, that are uh, most challenged with the lack of resources. Uh, and so this, to me, does not seem to be simply an issue of race that defines where you stand. Um, there is a multicultural, multiracial supermajority, I believe, in this country that says, hey, it's probably a bad idea to defund your police department. Um, and so, you know, I generally, as I did in that case, in, in trying to battle against what I thought were really badly designed jail release policies, I reached out to the community and heard very clearly and asked them to join me. Uh, and they did. Yeah, we actually did polling. And it really showed just in very like scientific numbers yeah. that every race, every demographic, every geography uh, did not want fewer police, yeah. with the exception disproportionately of young white people in yeah. Oakland. I mean, it may. <laughs> it, I mean, it makes sense that you know, they're because they're the, they're victimized in, in you know lower income communities, yeah. you know, so they they want to be safe. They don't want you know to have their sons and brothers shot and killed on on mm -hmm. unjust without justification, but they certainly want to. be you know, public safety. Uh, here's another audience question. What plans are in place if another pandemic occurs? Well, I think we've learned a lot. Yeah. Boy, I think our yeah. muscle is, is quite good. And uh, while I think our public is really exhausted from, from the 
controls. Um, I do think that we have a, a whole new response system. And I think the important thing is for us to continue to get our residents volunteering, to keep our you know, emergency response muscle active uh, so that we don't forget the lessons that we've learned. Yeah. yeah, the untold story, I think, the pandemic was the amount of volunteer energy yeah. that was dedicated to, to supporting other community members. It really it made me so proud as, as mayor of the city of San Jose to see thousands of people out there supporting us through an initiative we called Silicon Valley Strong. Um, similarly to what happened when we had a flood, we had you know literally that Saturday, uh, nearly 4,000 volunteers came out to help people get out of their homes and clean up their homes. You know, there is, and you know, we are blessed to live in a community like the Bay Area. Uh, people fundamentally get it that we are all sharing this space and we need to look out for one another. Hmm. Let's see, here's another question. Uh, what are next steps for creating more active senior shared housing? Mm. Mm. We actually did that in Oakland with our home key funds. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want hats off to uh, Bay Area Community Services, BACS, uh, went out and bought a bunch of single family homes um, converted the bedrooms like into a keypad and created shared housing for formerly um, homeless seniors. Mm. And they love it because the neighborhoods are quiet. Mm. They have a front porch, they have a backyard. Um, so I think that is a great model. I mean, we've all been, I mean, at the end of the day, we do need to build more housing. We just physically don't have enough, mm -hmm. but this kind of creative reuse of existing building stock, whether it's the hotels and motels or single family homes, um, is really just a great way to quickly and effectively address homelessness and housing insecurity. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest impediment in your city, aside from the cost of land? Uh, it, which is a big one, but to building more housing. Cost of labor. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's a real labor shortage in the Bay Area, and it started actually during the Great Recession uh, when an awful lot of construction workers couldn't afford to live here. Uh, they left, and then we decided to have a building boom uh, and a jobs boom, and obviously there were a lot of problems, I think also with local governments, frankly. Uh, outside of Libby City and mine and, and London's, you know, we've got 99 other cities and towns in the Bay Area, and they're not all receptive to building housing. And you can't just have three ha cities bear that responsibility. I mean, we have to take Jesse's in Berkeley and throw that in the mix with us, but there aren't a, a lot of cities that are as willing to lean in. So we have a real labor shortage, and it's persisted to this day. Um, I, would, I think there are some unions that are stepping up, like the Carpenters and Laborers. Other unions, not so much. It would be nice to see more collaboration and expanding the, the hiring pool and really expanding the pipeline, because these are great opportunities, and great jobs for kids who decide college isn't their path. You can do pretty well in some of, the, some of these trades. Yeah. And I'll throw in another one that is one of Sam's favorites. Um, we consider ourselves like avid environmentalists, but we have to admit that CEQA is not working. Yeah. CEQA is being abused. It yeah. is really holding back. Um, it, it's not doing what it was supposed to do. And is that something I know? For those of you who don't know, California Environmental Quality Act. Yes. It's supposed uh, to protect the environment, but it really means any NIMBY can stop a project that really doesn't affect the environment that, yeah. at all. Yeah, bike lanes, I mean, whatever yeah. it might be. Uh, signed by Ronald, uh, Ronald Reagan, by the way. <laughs> Is that right? Didn't know that. Yeah. Really? I learned something from you. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's why I listen to you. <laughs> uh, okay, we're getting to the end here, so uh, here's a good question. What are your future plans? Would you consider... <laughs> can't read that. Something, oh, running for office again. I am going to get a job and work for a living. Uh, I just don't know exactly what that is, but I'll make a decision in a few weeks. <laughs> okay. So would you, I mean, you know, it's interesting. San Jose, I mean, San Francisco, of course, Kamala Harris, yeah. Gavin Newsom, Dianne Feinstein. Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. Uh, you folks know, really, have done pretty well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. David Chu, who uh, is now the city attorney, says that San Francisco politics is it's like a knife fight in a phone booth. Right, right. And if you can get out of San Francisco alive, <laughs> you know, you're kind of ready, you know, to rumble uh, on a bigger stage. Uh, why do you think San Jose and, you know, yeah, Oakland? Not too. since Normanetta, really. Have yeah. we had a mayor... You know, Norm was wonderful. I worked for him as a, as a teenager um, and went on to serve as a, as a cabinet member for two presidents. Um, you know, I can't explain why that is. We don't have the, you know, the power brokers that, you know, make everything happen. Uh, there, some might say, and I think uh, others 
other mayors in other cities might join me in saying the Bay Area, San Francisco gets an awful lot more media attention uh, disproportionately mm -hmm. to its size. For and better and worse. Yes, yes, and I'm sure London would love to have less attention. <laughs> um, Fox News anyway. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so, so we recognize uh, as a city, although we're very large, more than a million people, 10th largest, we don't bat our way to media attention. And uh, frankly, a lot of us are pretty happy with that. Really? Well, you know, I think we do pretty well on our own. Yeah, um, it's a much more low key city. Like, it is. You know, the city council works pretty it well. It helps us focus on getting things done. Yeah. Yeah. Future? Um, listen, Oakland deserves a 1,000% mayor to the last minute, which is going to be 10.59 a.m. on January 2nd. Um, and so I will decide what I'm going to do next when I grow up um, <laughs> after that. And, you know, whether that entails running for office again, I don't know. Mm. Um, there are many things that I don't like about politics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I really like serving my community, the place that I'm in love with, where I was born and raised. Um, I have a couple of kids to get out of high school and into college, so I might focus on that for yeah. two seconds. And, um, <laughs> but I, I will always, always love Oakland and be engaged, yeah. that's for sure. Last question, uh, what advice do you have or maybe have given Matt Mahan? Both these, your, your successors are in their 30s. Uh, they'll probably be in their 50s by the time they leave just because you age faster, I think, when you're there. But, uh, <laughs> but what advice, and, and Shank Tao, who you, you endorsed Matt Mahan, you were not, uh, did not endorse Shank Tao, but what, have they asked you, have you given advice, or what oh, would you tell yeah, them? Oh, yeah, I, I know, man, I've talked a lot, and um, I know everybody's given advice, so I try not to. But, uh, you know, they say in any job, never let anyone take your joy. Well. As mayor, you should never let go of the joy. When you walk in that first day in office thinking about the incredible things you can do for your community, there is great joy in that. The opportunity as mayor is greater than any other job, I believe, in government to have a wonderful impact on your community and really improve the quality of life for your neighbors, for your family, for, for people uh, you care about in your community. That joy should never be lost. And uh, I feel blessed that I've, I've retained it um, because it's easy to lose sometimes in, in, the, in the heat of the battle. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We've had great transition conversations, nothing but, you know, very collaborative spirit. And um, I've always had a personal great relationship with Shang Tao. Um, in fact, our sons went to elementary school together. And so some of our talk is more about how we've man how how to manage being a mother. Um, and my big advice is have a great scheduler. <laughs> who protects certain moments yes. of private time with your family. And you can blame the scheduler and say, I, I didn't even know that you were having an event that Saturday <laughs> night when my child is having their, you know, concert. Um, so that, that was yeah. more, um, more personal advice because these jobs are hard. I mean, you know, you're like, families. you're gushing on like how great it is to be a mayor. It's, it's also, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the best and the worst. Yeah. And to, to make it out, you know, with your family intact, with your friendships intact is also really important. Yeah. Well, let me just say for the audience, if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club efforts in making both virtual and in-person programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. Uh, Mayor Schaaf, Mayor LaCarta, thank you for your service and good luck with whatever comes next. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Good to be with you.